Let us pray together. Lord, thank you for the privilege of gathering together this morning in the name of your Son, Jesus. And based on his promise that when we gather together in his name, he is here in our midst. We thank you, Lord, that we are not just here with each other, but we are here with you. Open our hearts and minds to your presence. Make room in our hearts for that which you would desire to say to us, to work in us. And we say, speak to us, Lord. Your servants are listening. For it is in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, that we pray. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. There are times when picking a ser sermon subject is actually pretty easy because the collect for the day, you know, the opening prayer that is prayed, the Old Testament lesson, the psalm, the epistle, and the gospel all sort of speak with one voice. Even though they come from different sections of the scripture, they all come together and they all, in essence, say the same thing. And so it's easy to, in that light to try to weave something together that incorporates each of those sections. This is not one of those things. <laughs> uh, just the opposite. The collect, the Old Testament lesson, the psalm, the epistle, and the gospel, five things say very different things. And one, in fact, could preach a separate sermon on each of those sections. I will not do that. <laughs> Instead, what I want to do is talk a little bit about the issue of commitment and dedication to, to what it means to be a Christian. Because, first of all, that's the essence of what's happening with those who are presenting themselves for confirmation and reception. But it also is the heartbeat of what Paul is writing in Philippians. So that's really where I want to spend my time today, is with the Philippian lesson. However, before I get there, what I want to do is say something about Genesis and the colic. Because the Genesis lesson says something very, very important. I don't know whether you noticed or not, while God had Abraham do all of these things in terms of setting up these various animals for sacrifice, when it actually came time for the covenant to happen, Abraham fell asleep. And he fell asleep, actually God did that. God put, as it were, Abraham into this deep slumber. And then, it was only after that, that the pyrotechnics began to happen. And they all mean something. I don't have time to get into that, but in terms of the fire pot and all of that passing between the, the carcasses. And the point, one of the lessons of that passage was the covenant is God's initiative. In other words, it's really his action. The same is true for the death and resurrection of Jesus, of which the Genesis lesson is a foreshadowing. God chose... Not because we deserved it, but out of sheer love to send his son Jesus to become as one of us so that when we look in the face of Christ, we see precisely who God is. Remember, Jesus says to Philip, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. That means any idea that we have about God that somehow does not correspond or line up with what we see in Jesus is not what God is revealing to us. It's a different God. So, what we see, in a, and then not only does God reveal to us precisely what he wants us to see of himself in Jesus, the one that we can trust in and rely upon, but he takes our nature upon him, dies on the cross, paying the penalty for all of our sin, so that when Jesus cries out from the cross, my God, why have you forsaken me? He is echoing the cry of all of humanity who has ever felt alienated from God. He knows precisely what it is like to be completely and entirely human. And yet, God chose in Jesus' offering of himself to raise him up in resurrection, conquering all that Jesus bore on the cross, the sin, the alienation, the brokenness, all of that has been conquered in Christ Jesus. Which is why we can pray at the beginning of the prayer, the collect, 
O Lord, whose glory it is always to have mercy. In other words, no matter where we've been, no matter what we've done, when we come to God and ask for His mercy, that's what God delights to do. It is His glory to have mercy. Because that is, in fact, what God has done in Jesus. Left to our own devices without the coming of Christ, we would have no idea, no idea, that who we know in God is forgiving, merciful, and full of love, and by virtue of His death and resurrection, paved the way for us to come to God in the most intimate and personal of terms, knowing that as we open our hearts to Him, He does not reject us, just the opposite. Everything that He sees in us, the, the places where we struggle, the places where we're in difficulty and pain, the fears that nobody knows about but us, <coughs> He knows all of that. Remember we say in our services, you are the one to whom all hearts are open, all desires known. That should be for us a moment of relief. God knows exactly who I am. And in so doing, it is His glory in that moment as we share all of what's inside of us to do what? To have mercy and to forgive. Because the penalty for all of that has been paid in the death and resurrection of Christ. Now, that's important to know when we get to the epistle. So, if you will, turn with me in your leaflet over to the epistle reading. What Paul is trying to do is speak to this group of people as a pastor. A group of people who are really struggling with what it means to be a follower of Christ. In, in the time of Philippi, a Roman colony, uh, the Phil Philippi was, in fact, considered a part of the Roman Empire, so they wor worshipped Caesar. Caesar was a deity to them. And that's what every single group of people were required to do, was to honor Caesar and to call him a deity. Good citizenship in the Roman Empire was far more than merely following the laws, many of which were very sophisticated in terms of the way they dealt with issues of taxes and money, but the price of living under the Pax Romana, the peace of Rome, was to make peace with the fact to acknowledge that Caesar himself was a god. Caesar is Lord. And so here's this group of people who really are on the margins. Because to make the commitment to say Jesus is Lord instead of Caesar is Lord, meant that they were cut out of a lot of what was considered normal Roman life in the town of Philippi. And so what he's trying to do, and they're, they're struggling with this. This is not easy for them to do, to in essence to live at odds with their Roman culture that really was the culture of Philippi at the time. And so he's trying to, all through the Philippian letter, really worthy of your reading, to encourage them in the, because he is acknowledging the fact that I get it that it's tough, that this in fact is not easy for, me, for you. And so he's saying, remember when I was with you, join in imitating me and observe those who live according to the examples that you have in us. In other words, in the midst of trying to figure out how do we do this, remember what Paul has showed us. Remember what our leaders are showing us about what it actually means to be a follower of Christ in the midst of all of this difficulty. For, he says, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. And what he's describing here, and he goes into some detail, and notice he doesn't say many are living as enemies of Jesus. He's very specific. Many are living as enemies of what? The cross of Christ. That means being willing to pay a price for being his follower. Being willing to do what Christ asks of us, even when it costs you something. He's pointing, you see, to Jesus' suffering, to his willingness to live, and in fact, in such a way that eventually resulted in his being arrested by the Roman officials. In other words, it may cost you something to do this, so don't live like those who say, yeah, I want to be a follower of Jesus, but I also want to make peace with what it means to be a Roman citizen. And I actually sort of want it both ways. In other words, I want what I want, but I also want what Jesus wants. 
that's who Paul is describing here is as an enemy of what? The cross of Christ. In other words, he's talking about a very specific group of people. They could be church attenders, or maybe they're not church attenders. But the fact of the matter is, is that they're not willing to pay the price to live in a way that sets them clearly and publicly at odds with what it means to be a Roman citizen. Does that make sense? Nod your head. I, I don't mind back and forth, okay? You don't have to say amen like a Pentecostal, and that's what you'd like to, but I want to make sure we're connected. So, and then he begins to describe what that looks like. Many live as a cross of Christ. I have often told you of them, and now I tell you even with tears. For Paul to live in that kind of compromising fashion was for him a heartbreak. I mean, there, a part of what happens in any local church is that there's some people who are kind of more committed than others, and the temptation of the more committed is to point the finger at people who are not so committed. Well, what's wrong with them? Notice Paul's example. He, he's clear about what commitment means, but for him, it's heartbreaking. And if there are people in your congregation or people that you know, I'm sorry this popping keeps happening, people that you know who really are not faithful to Christ and yet they still want to call themselves a Christian, I want to say your job is to pray for them. Your job is to pray for them, not to gossip about them or be critical of them, but to pray for them. In fact, when I think of this and I see this, I want to say, where, God, if there are people for whom are really wrestling with this, where are my tears? And where are my tears for them? Because that's the fruit of intercession. They're enemies. And what do they look like? First of all, they're in this destruction. They may call themselves a follower of Christ. But are they going to heaven? Paul is saying maybe not. Their end is destruction. Their God is their belly. In other words, who is their God? It's not really the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's their own desires. In other words, I want to be able to do what I want to do and still say I'm a follower of Jesus. I'm not... Sure, you can do that. Because belly has to do with human appetite. Whether we're talking about spending money on myself, whether we're talking about sex, whether we're talking about food, whether we're talking about consumption of any kind, that's what we're just talking about here. My right to be able to spend whatever I want, to do whatever I want, to be wherever I am, because after all, it'll be okay. Paul is saying, actually, no, it's really not. Their glory, in fact, in the end, is their shame. In other words, what do you mean I don't have the right to do whatever I want to do? I mean, we live in a culture where much of what we see in the media, on television, and the like is all about the very things that Paul would say, oh, I'm so sorry that you're doing this. I don't even want to look at it. That's the very thing they're glorying in. That's, that's actually most of reality TV. Their minds, and he says it all in, a, in, a, in a one phrase, their minds are set on earthly things. In other words, they don't get the fact that they're actually mocking God. They just want to do whatever they want to do. They have no idea, in other words, of the eternal consequences of their behavior. And he said, so I'm trying to say to you, I understand that's part of what's going on. And so I'm calling you to try to think about a different example so that you can live differently from that. Why? But I, why? Because our citizenship is in heaven. In other words, and when he says that, he's not merely talking about an eternal destination. He's sort of understanding, like, even as you Philippians, when you became a Roman colony, adopted Roman ways because you understood yourself to be a Roman citizen. Now, because you belong to Christ, you're supposed to adopt Christ's ways. Remember we pray in the Lord's Prayer, Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done, on earth, how? As it is in heaven. And a part of what that prayer means is, I'm willing to commit myself to that. In other words, God being my helper, knowing that I am going to sin, knowing that life is difficult, knowing that I wrestle and struggle, I want you to so change my life so that I actually begin to look like someone whose citizenship isn't merely in the United States of America, or you name the country, but that I'm actually really someone whose destiny is someplace else. 
even as the Philippians had to let go of their Philippian culture to adapt a Roman culture. So also what it means to be a follower of Jesus means I begin to think critically about my own culture. What actually reflects the gospel and what doesn't? What does it mean to be a Christian here in the United States of America? And where does my culture say I should do this, but yet the gospel says, no, I think you should do that instead? It takes actually very critical thinking to begin to examine the cultural influences that you and I have had for many of us since birth and say, what, of what, my, what is it about my upbringing that actually looks like Christianity and what does not? And that's our task just as surely as it is a task of someone who lives in Venezuela or Nigeria or Singapore or India or any other planet on the, any other country on this planet. There's always a gap between what the scripture teaches and what I've been told was normal behavior. Always. And because that's the case, one of the, reasons, one of the things I love, for example, about being a part of a global Anglican communion is that I can listen to Christians from other countries and they can say, well, here's what it means for us to follow Christ. And, it cause, and here's what I see going on in the United States of America. And it causes me to see my own culture from their eyes. So I'm able to think more objectively because this is the soup I live in. I don't always notice those things, but let me tell you, when I hear it from a Ugandan whose culture is very different from mine, or I hear it from someone from India whose culture is very different from mine, or a Pakistani, then I have to stop and think in a whole different way about the things that I understand to be normal American life. You see, our citizenship is not merely a description of our eventual location after death. It's actually meant to be an explanation of why we live the way we do now. I hope you caught that. That our citizenship in heaven, which God has given us in Christ, is not merely meant to be a description of our location, of where we're going when we die. It's also meant to be an explanation of why we live now. We're learning what it means to live out a heavenly culture here in an American culture or wherever it is that God places us. And it is in that light that we choose to think about how we live. So we don't want to be like those people who say, I want to do whatever I want to do. That's very much American culture these days, isn't it? I want to do whatever I want to do, and nobody has the right to tell me otherwise. That's, that's their God is their belly, to use Philippian language. So now we want to live a little bit differently. So we say, God, in the midst of that culture... How do you want us to live? And then in the end, it's almost like a little PS. Paul says, because God is in the midst of changing us, so that when we get to heaven, we will be like heaven itself. He understands that now we wrestle. That it's not just secular culture versus Christian culture. It's personal. Why does he call the body our body of humiliation? You know, he, he's, he's not some Gnostic that hates human bodies. That's not Christianity. Instead, he understands that, that that struggle is not just of them and us. It's inside of me, right? That you and I have desires. The God is our belly. It can be us at times where we are drawn into things that we would never want to have happen, but in fact the temptations occur, and sometimes we give in. That's what Paul means when he talks about our body of humiliation. Sometimes we're drawn into things we wish had never, ever happened, which is why we begin by understanding that Jesus' forgiveness is based on what he has done. Remember, Abraham's asleep when the covenant comes. God is gracious in all that he does. So that in the midst of my wrestling, I can go to him and ask for his forgiveness, his healing and his mercy, and he always gives it. He always gives it. No matter what I've done, no matter where I've been. So then in the midst of this wrestling of God, I want to become something. I want to look more like heaven than I do my culture. I want you to change me into your likeness. He knows that it's a bumpy road. It isn't always easy. Which is why he says, 
The promise is he will transform the body of our humiliation, meaning all of us who wrestle with these things, into the body of his glory. That has to do with what he did in the resurrection. By the power that also enables him to make all things subject to himself. In other words, there isn't anything that is going to eventually rebel against Christ. It's all going to bend the knee, including the parts of myself that I wish weren't there. Does that make sense on your head? So when these people stand and make these commitments, and you stand and make your commitments as well to reaffirm what it means in Christ, it's not that you're always going to be perfect just because you say, I will with God's help. But it does put you on a trajectory. It's a willingness to be changed. It's a willing to really wrestle with the things that may not be so comfortable for you because they look like the culture. They don't look like the gospel. But you're willing to say, there's nothing that is off the table. I'm willing for you to deal with me, God, as you see fit. Because I want to be made like you. And sure, I'm going to fail at times. And you're gracious always to forgive. But my destination, my goal, and what you're working in me is heaven itself. And that's what I long for. Let's pray together. Lord, I thank you that in the midst of all that you know and love about us, the things that we wish were there, the things that we wish were not, I thank you that you are gracious, you forgive. I pray that you would continue to take us, to mold us, to shape us, and to make us more and more like you. That in all things, O oh Lord, we would reflect your love and your power, your joy, and the confidence that you give us because we belong to you. For it is in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, that we pray. Amen. Amen.